Welcome wrestling fans worldwide to Knoxville and the Great Smoky Mountains for the Ron Fuller Tennessee Studcast. Six feet nine inches tall, 265 pounds. This historic podcast from one of the most respected and successful wrestlers and promoters will follow the footsteps of one of the largest and oldest wrestling families on the planet. The Tennessee Stud, Ron Fuller. Through 93 years and four generations. The Stud has arrived. Old school or new fan, this unique broadcast will educate and captivate as Ron details decades of professional wrestling's growth with truly unforgettable stories. I want those people out there at home to hear the stud. Sit back and enjoy the ride with the Tennessee stud. The Tennessee stud. You will learn that name. You will remember it. And now, the stud is here. Please welcome the creator of the popular 605 podcast and the president of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, your co-host, the great Ryan Last. Hello again, friends, and welcome back to another edition of Ron Fuller's Studcast. I am the great Ryan Last. It's my pleasure to be with you once again as the Tennessee stud rides his horse right down those smoky mountains, leading us all along the way and sharing his personal tales in and around the wrestling business. And without any further ado, let's introduce him right now, the man of the hour, the Tennessee stud himself, Ron Fuller. Ron, how are you today? I'm great, Brian. Doing just wonderfully, you know, uh, ready to take that ride today. Uh, Got a lot of good stuff again, and we're right into Southeastern Wrestling at this point, uh, just getting on board, and uh, we're ready to ride up in the mountains a little bit some. I think we're going to do some of that, but before we get going, just one quick note here at the top. We'll talk a little bit more later on about the Super Stud cast and the rest of the story, but I want to say hello and welcome all the new listeners because the numbers have really gone up lately. We've seen so many new people joining the Stud cast, so many new people becoming patrons of the Stud cast, and of course, listening each and every week to this, the regular Stud cast. And we want to say hello and thank you for coming along with us on this ride. And of course, Every episode of the Studcast is available at any time. You can go to tnstud.com or fullerpod.com if you want to access the RSS feed and go back through the archives and get caught up to where we are right now. And speaking of that, Ron, where are we right now? Where are we riding to today? Well, we're going to uh, we're going to be uh, we're in the first two months basically of my new wrestling company. And uh, last week uh, I was able to win my first real challenge as a new promoter uh, when I talked my granddad into dropping his 10% booking fee, which really was a, a great uh, it was a great win for me uh, to have that happen and it gave and that's going to give me the opportunity to make obviously more profit and uh, possibly uh, it it's going to have enough effect on me I think that probably going to save my investment in Knoxville. It said that big a thing. Uh, it also opened the door for me to hire my own wrestlers and control my own destiny as a wrestling promoter. And that's what I really wanted. I wanted to have every opportunity I could to make this work. Um, we're going to talk some about the, the first cards, my first cards that I booked there. Uh, and, uh, and I, I started booking my own talent and, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about trying to change the perception of the sport in Knoxville and, uh, and then we'll talk a little bit of where maybe I'm working outside of Knoxville. So we've got a lot of ground we're going to cover here today. Horses all saddled up, and I'm ready to roll when you are, my man. Well, you mentioned the first card without the 10% booking fee. Let's go to that. Let's start right there. What was that first show that you had where you didn't have to worry anymore about sending 10% to your grandfather and Nick Ullis? Well, uh, the first show is going to be in uh, in Knoxville, obviously. Uh, it's uh, in the first Friday in December of 1974. And I'm already responsible at this point for getting my own talent. So I've got uh, Nelson Royal right off the bat uh, from out of North Carolina is going to make his first ever appearance in Knoxville and against a guy named Joe Costello. Uh, and obviously Nelson Royal is going to going to get a big win there. Uh, Johnny Weaver, another great old time star from the Carolinas. I talk him into coming across and uh, and helping me coming across the mountains there and helping me in Knoxville. And he's going to be the guy called the outlaw, uh, Don Kent, a pretty good worker out of Nashville who lives in Nashville, but he's not wrestling full time for them. So 
he, he comes in and uh, he has a great match with my great friend, uh, Les Thatcher, who's kind of responsible for helping me get these North Carolina guys, by the way. And then, uh, my brand new tag team that's just moved into town, man. Uh, and that's Dutch Mantel, uh, who everybody knows, or, you know, uh, the hairy Dutch Mantel, I like to call him. And then, then the old, old timer from England, John Foley, an old shooter from England. And, uh, they're recent recruits by me, and, and I've talked them into moving to Knoxville. And and then uh, they're going to beat on that night the current tag team champions, Ron Wright and Tommy Gilbert, and win the tag Tennessee Tag Championship. I'm going to wrestle in that night uh, the legendary Jackie Fargo, who is a friend of mine and my father's and my grandfather. I worked a significant amount of time for Roy in Tennessee and for my dad a lot, along with Don Fargo. This one is Jackie, though, a good friend of mine. And uh, I spent about a week trying to track him down, and I get a commitment from him for two Friday nights in a row. And uh, so obviously on this first night, we're going to work a wild match, and uh, we're going to bring us back again on top the next week. And uh, I needed wins over guys like this. I'm trying to get myself over as a single heel. And, and I've just started healing. It's a, it's a process for me to even learn how to do it properly. And a guy like that who's worked both babyface and heel, he's a great guy to work with. A great person for me to have this uh, opportunity to work with. A couple questions, Ron. When you try to book Jackie Fargo, is there any issue with the Nashville office? Because obviously he was one of their biggest stars, also a massive star in Memphis for Jerry Jarrett. Any issue with you after you break the 10% booking fee to use any of their guys, like, for instance, Jackie Fargo? I think there would have been a real problem for anybody other than me. But being Roy's grandson, I think when Roy turned me loose, he gave me the impression that I could go after anybody I wanted to. Uh, I never heard anything from them about the use of Jackie Fargo. They may have talked to Jackie about it, and they may have said, hey, you know, uh, we don't like your work in Knoxville. And I'm sure he would have said, well, why is that, guys? You know, because he didn't know the arrangement probably about the 10% booking fee. So, no, I never heard from them, and I don't think I've riled anybody's feathers, ruffled anybody's feathers except maybe Nick. And Nick's probably unhappy about all of it and me being able to use my own talent at all. And you probably don't care if Nick's upset about it. And I really don't <laughs> give a damn. Like I said last program, I don't give a damn what Nick thinks. Uh, so, so it doesn't bother me at all. One last question for you right now, Ron. Les Thatcher, obviously someone synonymous with Southeastern Championship Wrestling and really worked with you to turn that TV show into a dynamic TV show for its time. How is he as a wrestler? For anyone who only saw him as a commentator, describe Les as a worker. How good was he in the ring? Les is a great worker. Les is a, he's not a real big guy, but he gets everything out of his size that he could possibly get. He's a great seller, makes good comebacks, has a lot of fire, knows a lot of wrestling moves, uh, does a lot of wrestling in the matches. If he's got a heel that can, that can cost the spots, there's nothing that Les can't do. Uh, he is just a really great talent. But, uh, you know, as you've just mentioned, uh, my thinking here and my feeling this early on in owning this company is that's the guy I need to get not in the ring, but behind that desk and television to really take my business to the next level. And I'm going to finally get that done. But for this for the beginning year and the start, he's going to come over. He's going to wrestle for me. He's going to make those trips over uh, with Nelson Royal. Good buddies, good friends. It's my first opportunity to meet Nelson Royal. And what a fantastic uh, wrestler he is. Just phenomenal. I, I was really, really lucky to have the relationship with Les and him be able to find a guy like Johnny Weaver and uh, Nelson Royal and bring him across the mountain with him. Who else did you add in the weeks after that, Ron? Well, the next week, I'm going to add Jerry the King Lawler to the card. Uh, John Pierre, uh, Joe Skye, and Jerry Myatt. Now, the three of those, not not big names. Not tremendously big names, that's for sure. But uh, Lawler is, at this point, a pretty darn good talent. Uh, he is He's a guy that was trained in Tennessee. Uh, had just, uh, just a great 
great. You know, I don't have to tell people about Jerry the King Lawler. I mean, he. So Jerry comes and works for me. I knew Jerry from working in Memphis a few times, and uh, I have a good relationship with Jerry still to this very day. I have a great relationship with Jerry, and uh, so the next week I have a pretty good card. Then uh, following week on uh, the twentieth of December, nineteen seventy four. I got the three major players from from Carolina back. I got Nelson, Nelson Royal, Les Thatcher, and Johnny Weaver. Plus, I've got Dutch Mantel and John Foley and Ron Wright from the who is local. And I add to that card Tex McKenzie, uh, Jerry Lawler again, Mike Graham, uh, who wants to come in and see what I'm doing down there. Uh, I mean, up in Tennessee. So, heck yeah. Anytime I can get Mike on the card, he's a great, great wrestler. Uh, veteran Frank Morrell and a guy named Tony Costello. Heck of a card on the night of uh, December 20th. Uh, and uh, it was great to see Mike and spend some time with Mike. I think he spent the night with me, as a matter of fact. Uh, been good friends since I was probably uh, 16 years old. Uh, we go back a long, long way. And uh, my dad and his father obviously go back a long way, too. Did you ever get the impression that Mike wanted to leave Florida, break away, and try to do something on his own? Well, I never really considered that uh, until you just mentioned. That's a heck of a thought right there. You know, I mean, to, I wanted to get away from my dad. I, I wanted to try to do my own thing as quickly as possible. And I think Mike probably wanted to felt that felt those same feelings mike worked actually a lot for me in knoxville because he fell in love like i did with those mountains up there and that beautiful place that it is and the lakes and the the boating in the summertime and mike's going to come and wrestle quite a bit for me uh he almost falls in love on the top of the mountain that we talked about in last week's program with middlesbrough the cumberland gap well, there was a wreck on the mountain, and Mike leaves my car, and he goes back down the road, and he's just walking around, hanging out, while the cars are all waiting in line for the for them to clean up the wreck. And he meets a girl, and and just about falls in love. Then he wants to come regularly, because <laughs> he's got this girl up there in Kentucky. So, uh, you know, Mike's a great guy, and uh, uh, really a a super guy to add to your card because what a great uh, little wrestler he is, man. He's got all that grassing background down. How did the fans in Knoxville take the Tex McKenzie? Well, I don't know that they'd ever seen Tex before. Uh, and they probably uh, were thinking about me because we're fairly similar in size and height. Uh, you know, uh, Tex is not a great wrestler. Uh, but, uh, you know, Tex makes an impression. Actually, Tex got over fabulously in Australia. When I went to Australia, a lot of fans were talking to me about Tex McKenzie. Uh, and I hadn't met Tex at that time. Uh, but uh, Tex, uh, Tex said uh, he, was, he was decent for me. And, uh, and I'm going to end up wrestling Tex some um, pretty soon uh, as we go through. Maybe today's show, I'm going to have a, get close to some matches with Tex uh, in, in Memphis. Going back to the talent, Ron. Is there anyone else that you add in 74? Well, the last Friday night in 1974, uh, added to that card, Ray Candy, Sam Bass, a Rocky Smith, the Inferno with the loaded boot, Ed, Ed Wiskowski, uh, and Pierre Bonnet. Uh, and my future star that night starts that's going to be a big, big component of changing the impression of what wrestling is all about for me in, in uh, Knoxville. Uh, Dale Lewis, the Olympic wrestler Dale Lewis, is going to not just come to wrestle for me, but he's going to come and live in Knoxville too uh, and work the Tennessee Territory. So I'm out of Knoxville, but work for me on the weekends uh, specifically. So uh, it's only my 10th week as a heel in Knoxville, and, uh, and I'm starting to get some pretty serious heat myself. So that's a pretty decent card right there. If you add those guys I just mentioned there, uh, Sam Bass, great talent. You was a wrestler at this point. He's going to become a tremendous manager. He's already doing a little managing. Ray Candy's a good talent too. Uh, and uh, Rocky Smith, gosh, the, the loaded boot Inferno, fabulous, fabulous talent. Uh, really, really lucky to have those type of guys on the card. So let's look at Southeastern at this period of time. You've been there approximately 10 weeks or so as the owner. 
But how are you feeling about these shows? Because you're not just promoting them at this period of time. You're also booking them. Are you happy talent-wise with who you're able to bring in? And what are you focusing on at this point as the promoter and the booker? I was pretty happy with the wrestlers. I thought I'd done a pretty decent job in the first month or so and trying to piece cards together and trying to find some really good talent. And uh, and I'd rounded up a pretty good group in those first few weeks. And considering I had no help from Nashville, I, my my crowds were not going down. They were increasing. And I was really pleased with that part of it. That's always a good sign. The last two cards we just talked about were headlined by me and Ron Wright. And uh, both of those cards just about sold out. Uh, the one after Christmas did sell out. So the crowds have doubled basically since uh, October the 25th, the night when I started. But the building at Chilhowie Park that we were in was just a small building, and it was not set up very well for wrestling. Uh, it, in fact, it was a horrible setup for wrestling. And uh, so I had to work with what was there, but I had already booked the Knoxville Coliseum for, for the January, for a date in January. I was just hell-bent on getting into that big building and hell-bent on trying to, to make uh, – the, the changes in the attitudes of the fans. And that's where my focus was. You asked about my focus. My focus wasn't so intent on, uh, on actual talent for the events as the fact that, that I wanted to, to educate my fans to what real wrestling looked like. I needed that, uh, I, because I wanted to sell wrestling and they had not sold wrestling there in the past. Uh, so, uh, I wanted to broaden the sports appeal. I, I wanted to broaden wrestling's appeal locally uh, by focusing on wrestling and getting away from the blood and guts approach that Kazana had before me there. Uh, I wanted the word wrestling on the marquee to mean something uh, like it did in Florida. And uh, I had really had my work cut out for me, uh, you know, but that was my goal. I wanted to make Florida wrestling uh, synonymous with the Smoky Mountains and with the Knoxville territory. How do you go about doing that? If you have an existing audience, even though you're starting to add new fans, how do you change the mindset of the audience, of the fans? Well, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, you know, uh, the perfect wrestler just happened to have arrived that's going to help me do just that. Uh and uh, he just won his first match in Knoxville uh, last Friday night in the in 1974, and that's the Olympian Dale Lewis. And Dale and I go back a long ways, back to when I was in high school. Actually, first time I ever met Dale Lewis, and he was working for my dad in Atlanta. And uh, Dale came to um, my high school, Briarcliff High School, had a had a state championship team for seven years in a row, and uh, he came there. And, and wrestles. Some of the boys on the team, they were so impressed by him. So he's one of the greatest amateurs of all time. He won two national championships. He represented the United States as, as, a, Greco -Roman, as a Greco Roman heavyweight in uh, both the 1956 and the 1960 Olympics. He's about 6'1, about 250 pounds uh, at his Olympic weight. And at the time he's wrestling for me then, he weighs about 275 pounds. So there is the guy that I'm going to utilize to try to change the perception of wrestling in Knoxville. And, uh, and that's going to take me a little bit of work, but I have an idea for it. What do you do? So the morning, basically, the morning after Dale's first Knoxville wrestling match, I tell him to meet me at the television station about 30 minutes before everybody else shows up. I want to have some time to spend with him to tell him not just what I want him to do on the program for that day, but what I want to do in the future, where I want to take this, this town and this territory. So I told him the night before to just wear his best suit. And, uh, and he's not going to be working on TV. And I told him this at the matches the night before. And he looks at me really puzzled, and he starts asking me why. He's, he's very concerned. Well, what's the deal? You know, it's my, I'm just come here, and I, how am I going to get over? And I told him that let's talk about it tomorrow. We'd have more time at TV. So he shows up about 30 minutes ahead of everybody else, and we sit down, and I explain to him in brief terms uh, what I want to accomplish with my new business. I tell him, you know, I – 
about the prior talent level and uh, and you know which was really poor and he would have recognized it to be in poor talent level that uh, Kazana was having to deal with. And I talked to him about the extreme absence, just the total absence of wrestling in the product being presented every night prior to the purchase of Knoxville. They just, there was very little wrestling and all just blood and guts, and it didn't make any sense. Uh, we discussed uh, my goal about bringing Florida wrestling, Florida's type of wrestling to Tennessee and changing the mindset of the present fans while, pre -create, while creating. I wanted to create a much larger fan base by tapping into the more discriminating audience that's potentially out there to watch wrestling. Uh, but though that audience just wasn't ever going to buy what John Kazana was trying to sell them. And I didn't want to sell the people uh, blood and guts. I wanted to sell them wrestling. And I felt like that we could make that happen, uh, me, and, me and Dale, with uh, Dale, what Dale did. So he asked me the same question, basically, you ask, you know, how do you do that? How do you change the perception of what the hell is going on here? So I took out a $1,000 bill that I had gone the day before and to the bank and, and got a thousand dollar bill. I took it out of my pocket and I, he had it on his suit and I had a little pin there expecting that he was going to say that. And, uh, and I pinned that thousand dollars on the lapel of his suit. And we'd spend another 15 minutes talking about what I wanted him to do with this thousand dollar bill. Uh, and, uh, so, uh, within that next hour, uh, he went on and did an interview and, uh, it was, it was right on. It was pretty much spot on what I wanted to have happen. Who did he do the interview with? Was big Jim Hess still your broadcaster at this time? Yes. I mean, you know, I'm just getting started. I have not changed to the big station in Knoxville. I'm still on the small station on the top of the hill and, uh, you know, top of the mountain, basically. And uh, Jim Hess is is my heart. He's my what I'm going to just say it like he was my horrible commentator. He, he's all I had, and uh, <laughs> and he's the guy I inherited from John Kazana. You know, I didn't I didn't pick him. You know, and uh, and I and I even warned Dale about him. You know, what you're going to find with this commentator and how he's going to be. I didn't want Dale to go out there and this guy act like an idiot. And they'll not be ready and expecting it uh, potentially. So uh, I gave him a, an interview, uh, and uh, I kind of told him what I wanted him to say. And and then, sure enough, when Jim Hess starts the interview, he and I'll try as best as I can remember here to to give you an idea of kind of what Dale says during this interview. But as best I can remember, Big Jim Hess says something to him right off the bat. Something's some foolish, like, uh, you know, I hear you were a pretty good wrestler in high school and college. And, uh, and so I'd already warned Dale about it, you know. I mean, instead of saying, that, you know, Les Thatcher, as an example, as the head commentator, would go, Dale, you are one of the greatest wrestlers of all time. You've wrestled in the Olympics. You've been all over the world. Instead, Big Jim Hess says, well, I hear you're a pretty good wrestler in high school and college. So Dale kind of just takes over, and he says, as I remember, he says something like, uh, no fat man, I was a great high school, college, and Olympic wrestler, and now I'm the best professional wrestler alive. Uh, I prefer, and he says to him right off the bat, he says, I prefer you keep your mouth shut while I'm out here. Okay, in other words, just shut up, you know, and, and he says, you are not what these people out here watching television are tuned in for uh you're just a lowly commentator and in spite of your perception of yourself as a star here you're just another fat hillbilly <laughs> so i was like hey you got a boy dale you know and then he just continues i'm here for one reason to educate the people in this deprived part of the country and and about what a real wrestler looks like and is capable of when the bell rings uh, uh you pay your money to see me, and for the first time ever, you'll see a real wrestler. And then Hess interrupts because, <laughs> uh, you know, what? what's that money you got pinned on your suit of your lapel for? 
So Dale, Dale goes right into his face. I mean, he just turns around uh, away from the camera, steps up to, to Jim Hess, and, uh, and he says, uh, don't ever interrupt me again. You know, and then he turns back to the camera and he points at the money on his lapel. And he says, this is a thousand dollar bill. I'm going to wrestle a so-called wrestler every night. And sometimes two of them at a time, because I am better than any one guy. I'll beat two wrestlers at a time. And I'm going to take care of my business that I'm getting paid for. And then I'm going to have some real fun every night in every one of these towns I wrestle in around here. Uh, I think most of you rednecks out there are sitting at home and watching this show week after week and think that you could probably beat a wrestler. And I don't think any of you rednecks could even clean my wrestling boots, much less beat someone as powerful and knowledgeable as a real man like me. Uh, then it continues. In fact, that's what this thousand dollar bill is for. Every night in every city I go to wrestle in, in this part of the country, from this day forward until I decide I've whipped enough of your asses, I will give anybody this thousand dollar bill, any man that will receive this thousand dollar bill if he can beat me. And that challenge is going to begin next Friday night. And then he turns to Hess and says, I hope your fat hillbilly ass is the first one in line next Friday night for that chance. <laughs> and then he just turns and walks away. I loved it. It was exactly what I wanted. I know he kind of impressed fans with being an arrogant guy. He's, he's obviously a heel. But at the same time, he's going to start doing something every night in every town that's just going to be remarkable. It, unlike anything they have ever seen, he's going to prove that wrestlers are more than just uh, – just blood and guts fighters and uh, and 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 guys uh, that uh, just uh, don't know how to get it done, don't know anything about the sport. Uh, it's going to he's going to be the guy that's really going to change the impression of how people feel about wrestling in Knoxville. Obviously, guys have done these challenges before, and of course, you went over Dale Lewis's legitimate wrestling background. Did you right away know that he would be the perfect wrestler for this kind of situation? Did you have any fears about him being the wrestler in this kind of situation? No, I didn't. And uh, I would have never done it with him had I not thought he was the perfect guy. Because Dale has a he has an easy going disposition. Uh, and I like that. Uh, he's very laid back and he's calm. He, he doesn't get riled up. He doesn't get excited. He doesn't get... Uh, pissed off uh, he's just he's he's very low keyed and keeps himself under control uh and i know that by the, him having that type of personality about him he's not going to hurt guys uh when he gets them in the ring he's just going to ride them around he's going to stretch them a little bit he's going to pin them he's not going to and he and when he does and people watch the way he does it and how easily he does it. I know it's going to impress fans with the, with just that, the ease of it all. They'll be going, wow, man, how did he do that so fast and so easily? Uh, he's not the snake pit type of guy. He's, he's not that type of guy. Uh, he's a slow-moving, methodical wrestling machine that's going to teach these fans some wrestling. And that's exactly what I was looking for. And I know that he's going to get it done for me. Uh, and they come, they line up that first Friday night, they line up, uh, probably 15 guys. And, uh, he goes out and, uh, I don't think he works at all on that card. He just goes out, does his challenge and he probably beats, uh, 12 out of the 15 before he says that's enough, you know, uh, just amazing. Uh, average match time, maybe a minute and a half, two minutes. Uh, take them down, roll them around, bang, flip them on their back, pin them. Uh, pretty darn impressive. Even the wrestlers. What's really funny is not just the fans are certainly intrigued by all this. They are just focused on that ring. Uh, even the wrestlers come out. They want to watch. They got to see it for themselves. 
of how he's going to handle this. And he really does it like a master. Did you have to convince him at all? Or was this something he was comfortable doing? He was very comfortable with it because he's such a great wrestler, because he is one of the best wrestlers of all time. Uh, and he is so confident in himself, has dealt with this situation many, many times. Uh, like I said, my dad brings him to the high school there, and, and he's wrestling guys that are state champions, going to win state championships, and he's doing the same thing to them that he's going to do these marks that show up there on a Friday night, and I know that. He's going to roll them around. He's going to play with them. He's going to make them feel so inferior. And these are pretty darn good wrestling boys. They're, they're winning state championships seven years in a row. He's going to make them feel like they know nothing about the sport. And that's exactly what I want him to do. I would, that's where I want him to take this is to make those fans love it. They start to watch it. They'll start to admire the fact that, gosh, there's a lot more to this than what we've been seeing for many, many years. And that's putting me in the right direction that I want to go. We will return with more of the stud cast in just a moment, including information about where the stud was working other than Knoxville in early 1975. But first let's go to this word about super stud cast number 13, as well as the rest of the story on 1979, the Knoxville wrestling war. The Tennessee Stud is lighting up the internet. Super Studcast number 13 about the destructive Knoxville wrestling war has set off a firestorm on the internet after the release of the 40-year-old video made in 1979 to expose wrestling and particularly southeastern wrestling owned by Ron Fuller. It's all at tnstud.com or patreon.com slash studcast. This remarkable story of betrayal by five very popular wrestlers trying to take over an end WA territory can be seen on YouTube at Bob Roop Plan B. When they stared failure in the face, this was their shocking response. The greatest wrestling history lesson ever told is more than three hours of fascinating listening for only $2.99. Maybe the best wrestling podcast ever done. It's bone chilling at TNstud.com or patreon.com slash studcast. There you hear it, the Super Studcast, available at patreon.com slash studcast, as well as tnstud.com. And thank you to everyone who has jumped on and joined the ride with the Tennessee Stud and heard not just the conversations with wrestling legends, but these deep dives into wrestling history, whether it's the Georgia War, whether it's Ron in Japan, and of course, the Knoxville Wrestling War. And this story is really just getting heated up now. There are so many more details, so much more information that's just breaking right now about this. And I think we're going to have to revisit it very, very soon, believe it or not, on the Super Studcast, because there is so much more to say. And I know you have a lot to say about it, Ron. But before we move forward with the show, just anything you want to say to the patrons, because they've really been coming out and we've seen such an increase, not just in the regular Studcast, but in the Super Studcast, a lot of new people listening. Yeah, I, and I, I, obviously, I really, really appreciate the patrons. Uh, they they helped to make this happen. And I noticed when I first began doing this and asking for two ninety nine for a three hour program, uh, it was a little bit difficult because uh, fans aren't used to paying uh, on the internet for this type of thing. But wow, I mean, once it started, once I was able to put a few of these super stud casts out there and people realize what kind of a deep dive we're talking about, uh, gosh, nowadays, it, this, this number 13 here has just been remarkable. This program the super stud cast about the Knoxville wrestling war is just exploded the patron audience because they've been thinking about it and thinking about it. And this one they listen to and wow, it's just, it's really been amazing. The comments from people that from patrons now that have listened to the super stud cast are like, and they go back and they listen to all the others and <laughs> they go back and they say, wow, I, I'm going to get them all, you know? And, uh, and I'm real happy about that, and I'm real proud of that. And uh, and I and we give 
our audience here every week, a great program. And I'm, I love the fact that once a month I can do something extra special uh, and, and take those deep dives, which I really like to do. I like to get into the, the, the meat of the matter, so to speak, and uh, really get down to where it makes real sense for wrestling fans. And they learn some history with every one of those. Deep dives into wrestling history as well as the Tennessee Studs conversations with wrestling legends like Jim Cornette, Terry Funk, Stan Hansen, Kevin Sullivan, and so many more. Check it out right now. The Super Stud Cast and the rest of the story available each and every month at TNStud.com or Patreon.com slash Studcast. Only $2.99 to hear the extra three hours a month, the best deal in professional wrestling. But Ron, let's get back to the story. We teased it before the break. Knoxville wasn't the only place you wrestled in early 1975. What else were you doing? Well, you know, what I was doing is I was losing money. Uh, you know, rather than going and wrestling somewhere else, I want I felt like that, you know, I'd bought a company and and I would be able to not only run Knoxville, but I would be able to go to some of the outlying little smaller towns on Saturday nights or on a Thursday night and be able to put some people in the building there too. But Business was just slow. It was just not uh, there at that point. Uh, they did not have the proper TV, and they did not have the proper talent. They had not pushed wrestling. They had pushed the other types of uh, uh, other people's uh, philosophy of what wrestling should be, and it it wasn't happening for me. So it, that made it very difficult on me because uh, I wasn't able to supplement my income from nightly events. It, as I had been used to doing, I'd been a wrestler for four years and I was used to going to a town and wrestling and getting some money for it. And now I was going to the town to promote a match. And not only did I not get any money for me as a wrestler for going out and doing what I did, I had to go into my pocket to pay guys because there wasn't enough money in the house to be able to pay the boys, I wanted to keep these good talent. I wanted to keep these guys. In order to keep them, I had to pay them out of my own pocket. So I decided that maybe I need to drop back on trying to run, run these small towns until I could build my interest in the wrestling in the in the town itself of Knoxville and in the surrounding area. And then I could go back and try these smaller towns again. So... I had to find myself basically a place to work. Uh, and I, I didn't want to work all week, uh, but I did, uh, you know, I did get the word out there that I'm available. Uh, you know, I'm here and I'm available and I'd like to work a couple nights a week. I'm not available on Fridays, but pretty much any other night of the week, I'm, uh, I'm available if you'd like to book me. And it, I sent actually a little uh, talk to the talk to uh, Crockett Sr., I talked to, uh, in, in North Carolina, I talked to uh, Barnett in Georgia, and I talked to, uh, uh, to Roy and, uh, Jeff and Jerry Jarrett uh, running the west side of Tennessee. And so it didn't take long. I mean, a couple of days after I spoke to, to uh, the Jarrett and, uh, and Roy in, Na in Nashville, I got a call from uh, one of the promoters in, in Chattanooga, his name was Harry Thornton. He was a part owner of Chattanooga, along with my grandfather, Roy, and Nick Goulas. And, uh, you know, so Harry says, uh, you know, Ron, you're right, you're close by. And uh, I know you aren't going to be able to work my TVs. And you're not going to be able to uh, to to come any other nights other than a Saturday. But, you know, he's, he's basically saying, I'd like to use you on just about every Saturday night. And it was a start for me. Uh, it kind of got me clicked off and, and I worked myself, uh, out of, out of a hole that I was going to be in. If I continue to run these towns before I could change the perception of the sport. That's why I really wanted to do it by using a guy like Dale Lewis, because I felt like Dale could change everything potentially in four, five, six months. If he stays for me that long, there, everybody's going to have more of an interest and more of an appreciation for wrestling itself. So that's what I do. I, I take, I take Harry Thornton up on it. And, uh, on Saturday night, November 7th, 1974, 
uh, I go work in Chattanooga. And I've not worked there since 1971, December of 1971, when I came to visit my brother out of Florida and we spent a week uh, running the roads uh, in, in Tennessee. So, you know, now I'm back in Chattanooga on November 7th, 1974. I work with Salento Rodriguez, who is, who I think we've talked about before. He's a deaf and dumb wrestler. He can't speak and he can't hear. Uh, but he's a tremendous talent in the ring. Amazing what he can do uh, without being able to hear or, or to, you know, to, to talk to you. Uh, uh, and a great guy as well. Uh, you know, obviously I win, I win the first night there. And, uh, you know, I've, I've wrestled Salento on several different occasions. Uh, I, I love working with him. He's a great worker. And, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, it's kind of a pleasure for me to be able to start out with Salento Rodriguez. And then he says, uh, you know, uh, Harry talks to me and he says, Ron, uh, I, I'm, I've got your book back in two weeks on November 21st. And, uh, in the meantime, that's when we talked last week in uh, the last episode. I have this conversation with Roy about, you know, Roy, I, I need to get this 10% booking fee off my back. And I explained to him all the reasons why, you know, your wrestlers are inferior and they, they don't show up and all the reasons why I needed to get it off my back. And, uh, and he agrees to drop it. And I've been okay to, you know, to, to stop paying it. Uh, so... And like I said last week, uh, Nick Goulas was very upset about uh, Roy's decision. Uh, but Nick is part owner of Chattanooga here, you know, and and then there's been there and, and running that town for a long, long time, maybe 20, 25 years. Uh, so, so Goulas is in position now to do something about my little deal with Roy in which I, I get him to drop the booking fee. And, uh, and as Goulas, uh, Nick is, is, uh, is, is normally able to do, he calls up Harry Thornton and, uh, he tells Harry Thornton, uh, don't book that guy. You know, I don't want him working in Chattanooga. And about two days before my event on November 21st, uh, I, uh, I get a call from Harry and he says, uh, Ron, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to be able to use you, uh, in Chattanooga. And it didn't take me very long to figure out where that came from. Uh, so I would get maybe a few more shots in Chattanooga in the future there, but maybe only once a month and maybe for only three months in early 1975. Uh, I don't know how I am talked or who talks uh, Nick into allowing me to come in and wrestle in those, in those events in early 1975. But Chattanooga does not turn out to be what, really I needed and what I was looking for. When you work against someone like Silento Rodriguez, who's deaf and dumb, how do you call spots? Well, you, you really don't, you talk in the, you, you, you pantomime with him in the dressing room and you may say, you may show him slams or, or just pantomime that a slam and uh, arm drag, you know, there's a lot of things. He's so sharp. He's been wrestling for so long. Uh, he has, his it's kind of like people that you know that that, that that are blind that can't see but their other senses are so well developed his senses are just great about he doesn't have it doesn't require to hear you what you're going to do he just almost has a feel for what you're going to do uh it's kind of like working with the japs uh, the japanese in japan you know you have no idea what's going to happen they shoot you in the ropes and out of a habit they say they talk to you in Japanese, you know, they back you in the rope and they'll hit you a couple of times. And then they'll say, and then they shoot you in the ropes, <laughs> so, you know, and it's not doing any good for them to call that spot, you know, in Salento's case, he's just, uh, he's just fabulous worker and he has such great skills. Uh, he can change his position quickly. Uh, he can go from one maneuver to another maneuver, expect something and get something else and just go right along with it. Uh, not many guys in the sport have that kind of ability. So where else did you get to work, Ron, during this period of time? Well, the good Lord blesses me, man, with a phone call. Uh, not, just a few days after I kind of get this call from Thornton 
uh, from Jerry Jarrett, who, who is the promoting Memphis, Tennessee. And uh, Memphis is one of the greatest wrestling cities in America. And it has been uh, since my dad lit that sucker up when we went there as a in the fifth as a fifth grader, uh, in uh, 1959. And dad just lit up Memphis. Uh, it had been dead, not doing any business for many many years, and he just uh, just exploded it. And uh, so Jared had happened to be having a problem with his top heel, who was Jerry Lawler, and he was kind of in a position where. Jerry and he weren't getting along and I, I didn't ask any questions. It's none of my business, you know, and he's going to tell me about it. But I say, Jerry, you know, I don't, I, I know Jerry Lawler and, uh, you know, he's a friend of mine and it's not necessary for you to tell me exactly what's going on. Uh, you know, uh, if you'd like for me to come over, I'd love to work for you. Uh, so we ask if I I'm available for every Monday night to come to Memphis uh, I ask, uh, obviously, the obvious questions that most wrestlers ask when they're asked something like this. I, I ask, uh, how, how are you going to use me? Uh, and he says, uh, you know, I'm going to use you as my top heel uh, because he'd already heard that I was now working as a heel for the first time in my life. Uh, maybe he got somebody said, hey, this guy has got some talent as a heel. So uh, I told him uh, that uh, I could... I couldn't be available for Memphis TV on Saturdays. That's I thought right then he's going to go, gosh, man, I, how, how the heck can I put you on top, Ron? And I don't have you to wrestle on my television, make your interviews and stuff like that. So, but I, I got a level with him, you know, because I tell him, say, Jerry, I own a town my own now, and, and my TV's on a Saturday. There's no way I can possibly make your TV and drive back across the state and do my television at, on the same day. So, so he, he kind of hesitates a little bit. And, uh, you know, I get the feeling what I can't see him. He's on the phone, but I get the feeling that I can, I can see his mind working. And, uh, and then he goes, uh, you know, well, Ron, I, I believe that I can do this. We can do this. Uh, he says, uh, what I do is I shoot film. I film matches with 16 millimeter, uh, like they do it in Florida. You know, uh, they're pretty, pretty far advanced there in Memphis. And then they're shooting on 15, 16 millimeter film and coming back and showing that on the program. So he says, what I can do is I'll have, uh, have them record your matches. And then I will have Lance do an interview with you each Monday night after your match that you'll be talking about your next opponent for the following Monday. So, you know, when he lays all this out, uh, you know, uh, it's a, it, it seems like a workable deal to me. I, I see that this has potential to be able to draw. And, uh, you know, so then, uh, I ask him again about the last question, you know, and, and which he's always in is, you know, it's always in the wrestling business is what kind of money am I going to make? And uh, so he says, uh, if, if you can fill the Mid-South Coliseum, uh, then you're going to make some great money. Uh, so I knew from working there that that building, size of that building, it's, it's over 10,000 people. Uh, that, uh, there were a couple of times in the early 1970s uh, that I went in there and worked and it was pretty decent crowd in there. It, it, you didn't sell it out every week. Uh, or I'd never, at the times I went there, it wasn't always sold out, but I knew that they drew pretty good and it was all going to depend on the opponents that they gave me. If they gave me guys that were good baby faces that had a great reputation that I could have a great match with, I felt real confident that I could fill up that Mid-South Coliseum for them, not just every once in a while, but maybe get really over and fill it up for them every week. So we cut a deal. Uh, it included my airfare in a hotel. Every time I went, they fly me nonstop from uh, Knoxville into Memphis, uh, put me up in the hotel for one night, and I go back out the next morning back in uh, home. So... I wrestled my first night in Memphis on uh, November 25th, 1974. I haven't been there since July 3rd, 1972. 
Uh, I'm a much better worker now in 1975 at this point in my life than I was three years earlier in 72. Uh, I'm going to go in there and work Memphis for Jarrett every Monday night for six straight months in the year of 1975. Uh, during that time frame, I'm going to set attendance records for them, and I'm going to make an average of $1,000 per show. Uh, and uh, How much is that, Brian? I mean, you, you, you're you great with that calculator, man. Uh, how much would that be uh, in today's money, that $1,000 per show I made in that six months in Knoxville? It would be a little over $4,600 each time, uh, approximately. Wow. So, you know, good as you money. can see, that's good money. Yeah. That was good money. It, it, what it did for me is I didn't have to find a bunch of towns now to work. Uh, I didn't have to go uh, some into Georgia and some over across the mountain into Carolina. Uh, I could work Memphis it by itself one night a week and make enough to pay my bills and and more importantly to pay my losses because I'm still trying to build the territory. I'm in my in the territory's in its infancy and I'm losing money on some of my Knoxville shows. I'm still not making a lot of money there and I'm not even in a position to try other towns yet. So this gives me that that a little bit of breathing room that I needed to survive there and to uh, be able to make a run at it and to and to be successful. That j call from Jerry Jarrett uh, just changes everything for me. And, uh, and I owe a lot for Jerry for calling me and for giving me that opportunity. And I went in there and I worked hard for him, and we became really close friends. As my brother and Jerry were, they were a lot closer than I was because Rob worked that Tennessee territory, and especially on that western side. That's a strange territory, that Tennessee territory. You got the east, you got the west, you got Birmingham in the south. Uh, Roy operates some of the towns. Nick operates some of the towns. Jerry Jarrett operates some of the towns. You got Louisville. It's just a strange territory, but I somehow fit into the mix and uh, and I'm blessed with the opportunity to make that big money on Monday nights in Memphis. Jerry Lawler is on the outs with Jerry Jarrett and The Office. You're brought in to be the top heel. Who are some of the guys you work with in your first few weeks in Memphis? Uh, they started me off kind of slow, uh, which is normal. Uh, you know, they 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 want to. It's going to take a little time to build me. Uh, so they started me out in November, my first night in uh, November of 1974. I worked with Joe Sky. He's not a top guy, uh, but uh, he's 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 a good talent, and and he, he gets me over great. Uh, second week, I come back on December second, nineteen seventy four, and I have Rufus R. Jones. Now that jumps it up a notch, uh, and uh, Rufus and I are old buddies. Uh, he's a guy I spent a lot of time with in St. Louis. We were making St. Louis quite a bit together in seventy two and seventy three. So it's kind of like being with your old buddy, and obviously Rufus puts me over great. Uh, he really helps build me. Uh, the third week in there, Tex McKenzie. <laughs> we talked about it earlier in the program. There's old Tex there. Uh, that's a struggle for me. Uh, you have to be uh, – it's not not easy to, to work with Tex. Uh, and uh, I don't have as good a match as I had with Rufus, uh, but I still – have I'm still gaining heat and I'm gaining momentum and Tex uh, everybody is putting me over so you know I get another big win there uh, the 15th of the month I come in there against uh, Jackie Fargo uh, now I have a bona fide star in Memphis uh, the Fargos have been stars in Memphis since the 60s since the <laughs> probably the early 60s uh, they've been around a long, long time in Memphis and uh, really, really stars. So Jackie does a job for me and, uh, you know, great match. God, I mean, now we've got that building growing every night. By the time I get to Jackie, uh, we're getting close to our first sellout that I've seen in the building. And that's my goal is to fill that sucker up. And then the next week on December 23rd, 
I'm going to wrestle a legend in Memphis. Uh, and, and a lot of people, when they, if they saw this guy and they know who this guy is, they would wonder how in the world does this guy ever get to be a legend? But he's a little Japanese dude uh, named Tojo Yamamoto. And uh, in, in, by Memphis standards, uh, you can't hardly get to be more popular than old Tojo. Uh, and Tojo carried my brother uh, in the early years of the 70s when Rob went there to work. And uh, Jerry Jarrett was Tojo's partner. And Jerry Jarrett uh, uh, quit working for a while. They moved Rob into that spot with Tojo. And Tojo made Rob so much money as a young kid that didn't know very much about the business. And Tojo comes in there and puts me over like a, like a, like a dream. Uh, I think that's the first sellout we see. And the wonderful part about it is it's two days prior to Christmas. It's a time of the year that normally that building be half full and it's full. Uh, I think Jerry that night, I remember was just like all smiles. He was like, wow, this is going somewhere. Uh, you know, he's, he's pretty much convinced that, that I'm going to be able to carry the weight for them. And uh, we're going to make a success out of this run with me on top. Uh, the following week is the last night, the December 29th, the last match in 1974 in Memphis. And the last match I worked in 1974. And, uh, and it's a Southern Heavyweight Championship tournament. It's one of those one-night tournaments in which I wrestle four different guys to get to the finals and then beat uh, – Jackie Fargo in the finals for the Southern Heavyweight Championship. Uh, at this point, uh, and this is after only about five or six weeks, pretty amazing. I'm pretty well made there. Uh, I am over already in Memphis, and and it helps me in Knoxville with my attitude toward toward what I'm trying to develop as as being a great heel worker. And I I see myself getting it done in Memphis. And it just it just enforces reinforces my thinking that Knoxville is no different than Memphis, and and I'm going to be able to to crank it up there as well. Memphis is a different market than Knoxville. Memphis is a better town than Knoxville uh, at this point. Now that's going to change over the next few years. I'm going to turn Knoxville into just as big or better than Memphis, and uh, nobody would have dreamed that possible at that time frame. They would have said, "No way, anybody will make a make a Memphis out of Knoxville," and that's kind of basically what I do. But I can see it happening with this first first five or six week run in Memphis that if I can start to sell out Mid-South Coliseum in Memphis, I will be someday able to sell out the Coliseum in Knoxville. Based on some of the names that you mentioned earlier and some of the names you wrestled in Memphis, was Jerry Jarrett also helping you for a little while here with some of the talent that you brought into Knoxville after you got away from the 10% deal with the Goulas Welch office? Yes. Yes, we had a great relationship, as I said, with Jerry. And the, the longer I worked for him, the more comfortable he felt with me. And he would send me guys that he was using sometimes on Monday. He would make them available to me. I already said I had uh, Jerry Lawler for a couple of events earlier. And I got those because of Jerry. Jerry, Jerry sent Lawler over there to work for me. Uh, and he had some pretty decent guys on the western side of Tennessee. So he was making those available to me, which was really nice. Ron, one last question before we wrap things up. You mentioned the Southern Heavyweight Championship tournament that you wrestled in on the 29th. Fans of the Studcast may remember a few weeks back, you talked about being the Southern Heavyweight Champion in Florida in 1973. So for those wondering, why were there two different Southern belts in different parts of the country at the very same time? Well, you know, that was a time frame in which... Fans didn't travel much. Uh, there was no cable TV. People didn't know what was happening in other parts of the country. If you lived in Memphis, you had no idea what was happening in Mobile, Alabama, as an example, or certainly not in Florida. And it, it made it easy for NWA to allow promoters 
the opportunity to have regional, let's call it the good word for it, I guess, is a regional champion. And uh, so Memphis had their own Southern heavyweight champion. And when I won that belt that night, I took it into the dressing room. I, it's a new belt. I'd never seen that belt before. It's a beautiful little belt. And it had plaques on the side of that belt. And it had the names of guys that had won it. And uh, I looked at the second plaque I looked at. And there was my granddad's brother, Herb Welch's name, as having worn that belt. That made me feel t wonderful, man, to have the opportunity to put on the same belt that my grandfather's brother had worn. And, uh, you know, just, I don't know if I was as good as Herb or not. You know, but uh, it sure made me feel good. So basically what happened is Florida has its own Southern recognized Southern heavyweight champion. Uh, Memphis has its own Southern heavyweight champion. And there wasn't much talk about it among the fans because the fans didn't know what's happening in Florida when they live in Tennessee. And when you live in Tennessee, you don't know what's happening in Texas. And uh, you, you, different promoters felt comfortable with having these belts. Uh, sometimes in the case of the junior heavyweight champion, there were, there was the situations where there might be two world junior heavyweight champions in the United States during the same time period. And, uh, most fans not be aware of that. It's kind of strange for back in the day, but that's the way it was back in that time. Ron, as we begin to wrap things up, we want to remind the listeners that you can become friends with the Tennessee stud on Facebook. The page, Ron Fuller, The Tennessee Stud. It's a great page to become friends with. You get updates about the show. You get to find out what's on the Super Studcast as well as communicate with The Tennessee Stud. Once again, the page, Ron Fuller, The Tennessee Stud. You can also follow The Stud on Instagram and Twitter at Ron Fuller Welch. You can follow me on Twitter at Great Brian Last. You can hear me on the 605 Super Podcast at 605pod.com or available wherever it is that you find your favorite podcasts. And I also want to bring up that you can stay in touch with the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network on Twitter at Super Podcasts and on Facebook at facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. We also want to remind you the Red Hot Super Studcast number 13, as well as number 14, has become one of the biggest podcasts in wrestling and, of course, one of the biggest stories in wrestling, believe it or not, 40 years later, 40 years after the betrayal and destruction of the NWA's Knoxville territory. These are must-listen broadcasts, and you can get them right now at tnstud.com or patreon.com slash studcast. Like I said before, we're still hearing more and more things about what went on in 1979 in Knoxville, and we're still hearing a lot of questions from you, the listeners, that you want answered about what went down in Knoxville in 79. So stay tuned. We're going to try to get more programming to you all about this amazing wrestling story. And we also want to remind you not to miss the next Super Studcast, Super Studcast number 15 on Tuesday, March 12th. The Tennessee Stud will count down his 10 most memorable matches. This should be quite interesting. Ron, you have to be looking forward to this one. Yeah, I really am. You know, I, and I'm really looking forward to getting getting my, my chart out that I have of all my matches and being able to go down the through that chart. Uh, gosh, it's going to bring back a whole lot of memories, and I'm really looking forward to that. That's a different one. Now, you know, I, I've not done any type of top 10 countdown before, and I may do more of these. Uh, if, if, if fans out there like it. And, uh, so this, this gives me an opportunity to, to relive the past and, uh, I'm looking very much forward to it. Uh, and I, I've got four or five off the top of my head that are definite and easy for me to come up with. And the other ones I'm going to be, I'm going to enjoy the process that I'm going to go through to do that super stud cast number 15. I'm sure the fans of the Tennessee stud can't wait. They're probably already guessing. Is he going to talk about wrestling Ric Flair? Is he going to talk about wrestling the bullet Bob Armstrong? Well, find out once again, super stud cast number 15 on Tuesday, March 12th at tnstud.com or patreon.com slash studcast. Ron, where are we going next week? Right here on the studcast. 
Well, we're going to we're going to jump right into it, man. Uh, like I had done in Knoxville, uh, jumped into a territory not knowing much about it or to buy in a town. I didn't know much about it. And and I've had this hankering and this thought in the back of my mind since the day I purchased it about that Coliseum downtown. And uh, we're going to we're going to open the door to wrestling in that Coliseum and the next program. Uh, and and it's the largest public building in the city. Uh, we're going to discuss uh, how I prepared both the fans and the wrestlers for this Coliseum show uh, and how it does at the box office, uh, whether it's a success or not, and uh, and about my plans. What are my plans then to make wrestling the biggest sport in eastern Tennessee? That is my goal. And uh, we're going to lay out some of the advertising ideas that I come up with, and uh, it'll be a great program. Ron Fuller's Studcast is a production of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. For the Tennessee Stud Ron Fuller, I'm the great Brian Last. The story continues next week.